This talk, I'm going to talk about uh, open hardware a bit, and this might be preaching to the choir, but I'll, I'll just give an overview of stuff. Um, I'm one of the people who uh, made open hardware projects kind of at the beginning before it was really a thing, and um, uh, but I think it, it's fantastic. Uh, it's really the way to go for pretty much any, any project that we might want to do. Uh, but like anything, um, uh, I want to talk about this because it's, it's very personal for me and give some background. I talked about this in my little talk uh, on opening day, so if you were there, sorry to repeat some of it, uh, but I am a TV addict. And uh, I say that because this is why what I do is meaningful for me. We're, we're very much um, uh, a product of our upbringing, and it, it's not like we're trapped by it, but it, it, it informs who we are in a big way. And um, in inventing, I'm an inventor, and inventing is really about um, doing things that are meaningful. Like, we can invent things that are stupid. <laughs> I mean, we do that all the time, but why would you put that out into the world? Let's put meaningful things out in the world. And the reason why what I do um, is meaningful to me is because of my background, which really sucked. I was horribly bullied as a kid. Uh, targeted for being an introverted geek. That wasn't a, a safe thing back in the 1960s when I was a little kid. Uh, it's, it's still not so safe now, but it's not as bad. But being an introverted geek, being fat, I was fat as a little kid, being gay, liking learning, somehow that's a bad thing for bullies, and um, not caring who wins at a game, that was really terrible. Uh, so being beaten up in school pretty much every day, often as the gym teacher watched. Who becomes gym teachers? I just, uh, anyways, life sucked. Uh, Same people who bully you? Yeah, become cops later maybe, or CEOs, or vice presidents. Or being a VC. <laughs> or DCs. So my parents were clueless, they were depressed as well, and I was just horribly depressed. So I tried to escape into television, which of course doesn't work. But you know, as long as I was watching TV, I could seem to forget about my horrible existence. And you know, kids on TV, unlike me, were like beautiful, you know. <laughs> and they had understanding parents and, and, and friends who loved them and um, and problems that resolve always at the end of the show, and it just made me more depressed comparing myself to all of that. And, um, and time went away, and I didn't do anything useful. I just ate junk food and got fatter. I got more depressed, only to be more of a target at school, only to want to escape more into TV when I got home. And that is called addiction. And TV was and is my first addiction. I tried a bunch of later too, but <coughs> none of them work. Uh, they take away much more than they give. So that was as a kid, and for the first pretty much half of my life, time went away staring at the screen. And now, of course, we have lots of screens, but um, uh, yeah. But eventually, by 1980, when I was 23 years old, I quit cold for. I got rid of all the TVs from my apartment. I had a lot of them because I was a geek. I'd bring them home and fix them, and uh, there were people throwing them away. I'd bring them home and fix them. I got rid of all of them, and um, that was the beginning of a long, long process of learning to live a life I love. And I eventually did learn to live a life I really loved, and it was a lot of work. Um, and I learned to, I had time, I could do things that I actually enjoyed, things that I <laughs> love. I became really good at it. There's that sign downstairs about <clears throat> um, spending 10,000 hours at any skill to become a master. Um, you spend 10,000 hours at something, you get good. I got good at doing geeky stuff, and I helped um, other companies with their electronic problems and did things like help uh, create virtual reality when it didn't exist back in the mid-80s, and voice recognition, and, and computer games, and uh, computer storage stuff, whatever. So I was a consultant for about 15 years. But, uh, and that all happened from getting rid of TV. That was a huge, huge step for me, getting rid of that horrible force from my life. But by 1993, TVs, I started noticing, were popping up everywhere in public places. Everywhere, everywhere. This horrible force that I got rid of in my life 
invading my consciousness again, marketing at me, filling my mind like TV does with stories that aren't there for my benefit or any of our benefit. It's just there to sell me shit I don't want or need, including political candidates. So I don't expose myself to that shit. Um, but in 93, they were all over in public places. Like, who wants to watch Dr. Phil when you're trying to eat lunch with friends? You know, or Gilligan's Island reruns, or whatever, that fucker in the White House. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, that was 93. <coughs> and, um, and then <laughs> I had this great idea to, I couldn't get rid of the TVs, but I could invent a keychain that would turn off TVs in public places. And I knew exactly how to do it, and that was in 93. But like so much, it takes time, a lot of time, to actually implement a project. So time went by, 10 years in fact. Uh, and pressure was building and friends were kept telling me, when are you gonna do this, when are you gonna do this? So there was all this pressure. Finally, I, I had to quit work because I didn't have enough time to do things I really, really, really wanted to do. So I quit work after saving up enough money to work on things, including TV Be Gone. Um, and, uh, and I worked on TV Be Gone and it took a year and a half. I thought it would take like maybe a few weeks to three months Things always take longer. But by 2004, I had TV Gone prototype working. And I was going all over San Francisco where I lived, turning TVs off in public places and really, really loving it. And I made ones for all my friends who were helping me with it and encouraging me. And we were all going around. And <coughs> all, of our, all of my friends' friends uh, were excited about it. And the, those people even told their friends, and they told their friends, and it seemed like there were so many people who wanted to turn TVs off in public places, and like, knew. So I'm like, wow, well, you know, one of the things I learned while consulting in companies was how to manufacture things. So I thought, this might be an opportunity. I'll, I'll, I'll manufacture as many as I can afford, and maybe I can sell them. And I did some math. If I could sell 5,000 of the 20,000 I could afford to make, then I would break even. And if I could sell any more, that would be profit. And even if it took five years or 10 years, whatever, I would make a profit and there would be all these people going around turning TVs off. And that would be really cool. And it turned out though that I was totally wrong. I didn't sell uh, 5,000 TV Be Gone's in 10 years, and not five years. I sold all 20,000 in three weeks and I've been making a living from it ever since. It was an overnight hit, and uh, I got invited to uh, give all these TV appearances for inventing something that turns the TVs off. And I was in New York Times and Pe People Magazine. I don't know if you know People Magazine if you're not from the US, but it's like Hollywood Gossip Magazine, but here, I'm on People Magazine, it's crazy. And um, uh, New York Times and the front page of the technology section and Fox, news. Fox <laughs> invited me on and I turned off all of their monitors live while 14 million people watched. That was fun. So um, yeah, anyways, 15 years later, I'm still making a living from this project that I just made one for me. And um, because I'm an inventor putting things out that are meaningful for me, and if you do that, you put something out that's meaningful to you, if it's meaningful to other people, those are exactly the kind of things that people will pay you to do. And that's capitalism at its best. Of course, there are other problems with capitalism, but that's another talk. So inventing is sort of boiled down to three simple steps. You see a problem, in this case, like TVs all over in public places, and then you have an idea on how to solve it. You know, it's like a remote control to turn them all off. And then, of course, it's a long process, but you do what you need to do to implement it, and then the thing actually exists in the world as a product you can put out there. So, through the years, um, I'm an inventor, I've invented things for companies as a consultant, and it just so happens that my brother, introduced my brother, he's a patent attorney. And, you know, this is a Jewish mom's dream, my son the engineer and my son, son the lawyer. And, um, and of course it's a perfect match because inventors patent things, right? And that's what one does. And I never even thought about it really. It 
just seemed like the thing to do, and that's what all inventors do, and that's what I did. I invented, with the help of my brother, TV Beyond. And um, I've had a lot of patents. Um, it's just what inventors do. I never really thought about it. And patents um, are supposed to be for the small inventor to encourage innovation and give the person who invented it a, a monopoly for a limited period of time so they can put their thing out in the world and profit from it. Um, unfortunately, even with your brother's a patent attorney and you do all the work and under his guidance or her guidance, um, it costs a lot of money. It's 30,000 minimum. You have to make it to be useful. It has to be uh, in other countries as well, China and Europe, and translated in all these languages, it cost me $30,000, US dollars. Um, but um, it was an overnight success, TV be gone, and um, you know, and it says patent pending on the package. Uh, it got me invited to lots and lots of events. I'm an introverted geek, but somehow it turns out that I actually like public speaking. And I got invited to hacker conferences, and at my second hacker conference, which was in Germany, by the Chaos Computer Club, their 23rd Chaos Communications Congress, uh, I gave a talk about TV Beyond. They invited me, and uh, there was like 1,200 people or something like that, and they loved it. They gave me a standing ovation. And I was like, what, what, what do I do with that? And uh, and then there's Q and A, and someone asks, kind of angrily, what's this patent thing? Why does it say patent pending, or patent uh, on your packaging? Why are you stifling innovation? And I'm like, uh, 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 what do you mean? Uh, uh, um, uh, it took me a year and a half to do this. It was a year and a half of my life, you know? Of course I patented it. I, um, there's people out there who only care about money. What if they take it and they, they take this away from me and, and then they put it out in the world instead of me? And, you know, maybe the patent uh, thing on there prevented people from copying it when it became an overnight hit. And, um, um, but it got me thinking. None of those answers really made sense to me, even though I was saying them. And I went home, and within a few days, came up with a real answer, which was to make it open source. Open hardware didn't really exist as a, a public concept back then, but uh, I talked to a bunch of people, and of course I knew about open source software, free open source. Um, sorry, hard mess. But um, uh, yeah, I made it open source, and it's been open source ever since, and that's been a really important aspect of why TV Be Gone is successful. If I didn't do that, I would not be making a living from it anymore. The old paradigm is really only for huge corporations and not for individuals like us. The old paradigm is like, this is mine. You can't have it. If you come anywhere near it, I will sue your ass. Stay away. Um, you don't get any help. This works really well for some small number of huge corporations that make a lot of money doing this, but everyone else cannot take part in it. This new paradigm is like, look at this cool thing I did, check it out, it's really cool. If you wanna do it, I'll help you with it. Let's put this out and do it. I'm doing this to put it out into the world and you're gonna help fucking A, great. And this makes not like huge bucks like, like for huge corporations, but it makes people a living. It makes people enough money so they can make enough to do what they do by doing what they do. What do you need more than that? And it encourages much more innovation. People can take your idea to cruise with it. They share whatever back to you. It's, it's, it's great. Um, by 2010, people got together to actually explicitly talk about open hardware. There was an open hardware summit came up with um, a definition of open hardware, and uh, you release everything you need in order to recreate the project, um, and the only restrictions are allowed that are allowed to call it open hardware um, and use this logo is that you can require that people give you credit, attribution, 
legal term, and they must share alike. So if they use your thing, derive from it, whatever, those parts that are derived or what they use from your thing has to be shared with the same license. And then people worked on with Creative Commons and other licenses to have <coughs> licenses that apply to this. And this is the one that I use all the time. <clears throat> it's called CCBYSA, by, just like a book is by this author. This is a project by me, that's attribution. An essay is share alike, so anyone who uses any of my projects as long as they give me credit and share whatever they do with the same license, it's totally cool. If the people I mentioned earlier who took my project and reverse engineered it and used my name, if they used my, uh, and I had a student make them stop it, they used my open source, I mean, everything was online, they could have just done that and I would have been gladly just let them have use of it, but no. Uh, anyways, the way cool thing about open source open hardware license is that it's absolutely free. It's not $30,000. If you have $30,000 to do whatever you want with, it's way better to do it open source rather than waste the money on a patent. Um, also, if it's open source, you get lots and lots and lots of help for free from some of the most creative engineers on the planet. So there were all these people who did lots of really interesting things and they shared it with so many people and they shared what they innovated with my ideas back to me. Do that with a proprietary project. This all, all these engineers did all of this for me for free. Of course, there were a lot of people making TV Be Gone remote controls in all sorts of ways, and I didn't get a penny from it because they were doing it on their own. But those people went out and were super enthusiastically sharing it with other people, saying, look at this thing, it's a TV Be Gone, I made it, look at it, they turned TVs off, and it's like, Oh, wow, that's amazing. Uh, and then they hear about TV Be Gone, and then a lot of those people buy my thing. And then some people made a TV commercial for TV Be Gone. TV Be proprietary project, it's not gonna happen. Those are friends of mine, they were family, and uh, some other friend uh, used to be in a punk rock band, she did the music, and yeah, 30 seconds, it actually played on Fox TV. <laughs> Life is weird. So, you know, and when you do open source, you're sharing, other people like sharing, you get a lot of free will, uh, free goodwill, and, um, you know, proprietary projects, that just doesn't happen. But because of all of this, it made TV Be Gone super successful, and me, just a small company with a few friends, we all still make a living out of it for 15 years. And besides, you know, it, as people copy it and put it out into the world, they're putting my thing out in the world, the thing I put out in the world, is because I want it out in the world to make people's lives better, to make the world a better place for more people. So like, why don't I want people to copy it? Of course I want people to copy it. It's not the case for proprietary projects. I want people turning TVs off. I want people to spend time, to use time of their life for things that are way more enjoyable. That's why I put it out there, and the more people that make my thing, the better. And so for all these reasons, I'm, and who knows what, going to be successful. One thing though with IP law that I think is useful, even though so much, so much of it is broken, is uh, trademark. So, um, TV Be Gone is a name I came up with back in 1993, um, and just came with the idea of TV Be Gone. And, uh, I trademarked it, that's super cheap, it's super easy, it takes a few minutes, there's a form on the internet, it costs $350, and then the name is, is yours to use and no one else can use it. They can come, they can use my thing, if they want to use my name, then I'll license it, and I just do it really, I just want people to do it, so uh, that's not a big deal. But this is part of what protected me in that lawsuit against the guy who 
reverse engineered my thing and used my name and then I got all those angry emails which I talked about earlier uh, before the official talk. So um, yeah, trademarking is easy and very useful. I can't really think of any downsides for any project for open sourcing your hardware project except for possibly B2B projects, business to business. Because it really requires a community for it to work and some business to business projects there might not be a community. It just might be people who want to compete and not share and help. Wouldn't there be a, like a line at which the hardware is too complex for the average, let's say, um, for a community to build? So and, and I take my favorite example, it's a cell phone. Will you get a community building versions of your open source cell phone? Yes. No, I, I don't think <coughs> Yes, definitely. Because there are not, it, not it's if it's custom design. Not if it, if you've taken an off the shelf thing from Shenzhen that all people already do, yes. If you custom built this for your one specific product, probably not. Probably it's, it's, it's actually happening. So um, cell phone again, but that might just be a, a um, one, one thing, but there are a lot of very, very, very complex open source projects, and there's no real downside to. Um, but what if you invested half a million to a million dollars worth of R and D to build it, and someone, a competitor in Shenzhen, takes that? They they're using your R and D, then they produce it, and they're producing it at a lower cost than you, and now you've lost a lot of sales, <laughs> and you won't recoup your R and D costs yeah, because now they took it away. There's a difference. The device is really small and cheap. Your investment is very small, therefore you'll get it back very quickly. But if you're a niche product and then someone competes with you, but big enough for someone to do that, there must be a line but, at which but, it's no longer viable, right? Yeah, that's, the question that's is where perhaps that line? debatable. It's worth it's worth uh, exploring. Um, but the the thing to for the open source thing to work with the uh, um, you having the trademark for a name is um, you put it out there as big as possible with your name so people know it with your name and then more and more people want the original thing with the high quality. But if someone does go off and do it better and cheaper, then you have time to do something else that's cool. <laughs> True, but then let's say the money you lost in the R&D. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I think it's really important to not spend $2 million on a project. I know, um, but some projects are complicated, that's just what it costs. Yeah. Um, if you want to get into that market. So for example... Um, well, let's talk about to, this uh, okay, can you later. Okay. So um, uh, I want to talk about, so what happens if someone violates your uh, um, patent or your uh, open source license? So um, if you have a patent, the only recourse you have if someone infringes on your patent is to hire lawyers and go to court, which takes hundreds of thousands minimum of your money and months of your time. And as a small company, you can't do that. You just can't. That's not a viable option. Um, only corporations can do that, and they do. That's how they make money is through this shit. Um, if you have an open source license and someone violates your open source license, the only recourse you have is to hire lawyers, go to court, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on uh, lawyers in the courts, and spend months of your time. That's also not an option. <laughs> but it's free. <laughs> Open source licenses are free. So, um, and it is possible, because you put a lot of goodwill into the world, that you can get a lawyer for free to help you. And this has happened, and uh, it has there have been examples of this prevailing in court. Actually, is that, is that no longer the case in the US? You can go to the that um, body that will block imports without going fully to court. You can just report it, and it's going to be a lot cheaper. Uh, the imports. Yeah, you, there's some I tricks to pull. Is. There's some tricks to pull. Um, yeah, but that's only if it's that's only stopping the imports. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, so anyways, um, <laughs> there's lots of things that are debatable, um, but. I think it's really a fantastic thing to um, share. You'll get a lot of benefits from it, and um, you put your thing out in the world, and you help yourself, other people support you, and <clears throat> it's pretty much a win for everybody. So uh, that's my rant for your time. Here again is my contact info. And,
and um, I'll be teaching soldering all day today and tomorrow. If you want to come and learn to solder, I've got uh, two kits uh, available here. Uh, this one with the uh, blinky lights, colored cans, uh, poly lights, and then my music synthesizer kit. So, uh, and it's really fun to solder. Anyone can do it. I've done it for people of all ages all over the world. I love doing it. What's the youngest case today? Two and a half. <laughs> A very, very geeky little girl with her mom. <laughs> and the oldest has been 83. <laughs> so there's my kind of